Welcome to Pro Mindset Podcast. This is your host, Craig Doman. Uh, we are continuing. This is episode two. We're continuing the uh, journey of NFL Training Camp 2024. Before we get started, I want to put another plug in for my book, Pro Mindset. You can you can get your own copy at craigdoman.com. Pick up a, a copy of Pro Mindset and learn more of the principles so that you can apply them to your life and your career. Uh, episode two, episode one, we kind of went through the welcoming of the NFL, uh, especially for young players, what it's like to show up to training camp. Today, we're going to talk about um, going to depth a little bit more about the player's journey. Let's think about a rookie showing up in the NFL. He is potentially 22, 23 years old, not talking about the COVID guys that were 24. And there's guys in the locker room that are 38, 40 years old, kickers and long snappers and quarterbacks. And there's offensive linemen in their mid-30s. Uh, most of the primetime players in their high 20s, low 30s. Um, he's battling against men. When he showed up in college, the age differential was maximum five years. He goes to the pros, the maximum differential is probably 18. Uh, when Tom Brady was playing for the Buccaneers, the differential was double their age. You know, 22-year-old 22 year, 22 shows up, and Tom Brady's 45. So one of the biggest challenges is for the rookies. The veterans know what to expect. The veterans have been through it before. The veterans know how to pace themselves. The veterans know how to uh, get the rest, get off their feet, take mental breaks. They know how to lock in. They know how to manage their distractions, potential distractions. They know how to communicate and connect with their family members, their agent, their circle of influence. They've got it all figured out. They've been through it before. They know what to expect. They know how to prepare for the preseason games. Rookies don't. And for rookies, I think one of the most difficult things for them to make the adjustment to is simply the demand for excellence. In the NFL, it's your J-O-B. The coaches, the front office expect these guys to, to be pros. And not, you know, 99%, like I talked about the last time, is not enough. It's not enough. You've got to know your stuff every single day. You've got to, you've got to get the play sheet, the practice plan from your coach before practice. You need to go over that play sheet before practice. You need to um, take notes during your meetings before practice. And then during practice, you're making more mental notes about what those plays, the, just the intricacies of the play. What's the DNA of the play? How can I, and depending on what position I play, I respond a certain way to, let's say I'm an offense and I'm a, I'm a blocker, I'm blocking on this play. How do I respond? Where do I take my guy? How's the running back or the ball carrier going to uh, basically feed off me? What are those things? What are the things that you just can't do? The guys that do the things they shouldn't do don't play. They don't make the team. So as a rookie, you want to have a commanding knowledge of the playbook. And then you want to have an understanding of the dynamic of how the play shows up on the grass when the defense or the offense, the opposition is doing something to make it, make it difficult for you to do what you're supposed to do. And what is, what is plan B if you can't really accomplish what the play calls for and the, for the play still to be successful? And then how do you deal with the issue of learning from a vet? If you're a young player, how do you learn from a vet? How do you know if that guy's really telling you the truth? How do you, you know, if that guy is um, super dude, he's probably telling you the truth. But if it's a guy that feels threatened and thinks that you have a chance to take his job and take his roster spot, he's probably going to tell you 95% of the truth. He's going to, he's going to bring your trust, coach you up, help you out until that moment in time where he's, he senses his job is in jeopardy. At that point, when you trust him, when the rookie trusts him, he's going to say, man, that's not really that big a deal. Coach doesn't care if you do that or not. And the rookie's going to have that mixed message in his mind when he's in the middle of the play because the guy that he trusts, the guy that's been there for seven, eight, ten years, told him, hey, it's not that big a deal. It could reveal to the coaches that this rookie is not ready. And it may mean that Rookie's going to get a roster spot on the practice squad instead of the active roster. And the veteran has retained his job for another year. The other thing that happens in training camp that 
really isn't noticed by the fans and, and even family members for that matter is the idea that the depth chart really doesn't mean anything. In college football, the depth chart means a lot. If you're, if you're number one on the depth chart, when they call for the starters, you run out on the field. If you're number two, they call for the twos, you jump in. Three, so on and so forth. And when the season starts, um, whoever finished the training camp as the number one is the starter. But the way it works in the pros, because it's a business and because of the economics of the salary cap, and the fact that some teams would love a, a player that's making a ton of money to perhaps get beat out by a younger player who's younger, cheaper, and healthier. The dynamic is that the guy that's higher in the depth chart actually could be let go or traded the day or two before final cuts. And the reason why <clears throat> they don't manipulate or modify the uh, depth chart during camp is that teams don't want to tip their hand to the players in the locker room, so they start talking and start thinking about things and talking about things that the organization doesn't want to think about or talk about. So sometimes when the final cuts happen, number one makes it and number three makes it, and number two gets let go. Because if they would have, and, and maybe the team knew it all along, provided number three uh, showed certain things during the term of training camp, they were going to make that change because economically and salary cap wise, they needed to. They didn't tell anybody. They certainly didn't tell the players. And number two is blindsided and number three is pleasantly suppressed. And then in the event that number three, the younger player, doesn't show up and show out and doesn't earn the trust of his coach, number one makes it, number two is a very expensive backup, and number three is on the practice squad. So those are the types of movements that take place at the end of training camp that players don't really see coming because they just trust that the, that the depth chart is accurate. But the depth chart isn't accurate in the NFL because by design, the teams don't want the players to really know where they stand so they can make moves at the end of training camp that's in the best interest of the team, not only in personnel and performance, but also in economics. One of the things that's very important for young players is their support system. When you're in training camp and you're in the heat of the battle and you're confused and you're stressed out and perhaps after the first pieces of game, the evaluation of your performance in that game was mixed. Made some really nice plays, flashed some really excellent plays, and also had some middle errors. Players not sure, hey, I don't know where I stand. And the coaches aren't going to tell them. Uh, front office isn't going to tell them. Teammates don't know. Certainly agent and, and parents and significant others don't know, but the player has to go through a almost like a mental processing um, process to figure out how, how am I doing? Everybody wants to know how they're doing. In sports, we have scoreboards for a reason. So we can tell who's winning after the game's over and the clock hits zero, who won. Players are training that way. So all along the way, they want to know where they stand. They would rather be third on the depth chart if there's three guys at the position. Honestly, they would rather be third on the depth chart and know exactly where they stand than be 2B, 2A, and be in a battle for that second spot and not really know where they stand. It is absolutely insane how the mind plays games with these guys because they just want certainty. They just want to know. They want to wake up in the morning ever since high school. When they woke up on game day, they knew whether they were going to be the starter or not. Most of them were the stars in the field in, in high school. Most of them were the best player on the field any given Friday night, every game they played in high school. That's why they made it to the NFL. But once you get into the NFL, there's a measure of uncertainty that's very comfortable for players on a mental level because they don't necessarily know where they stand. And so much so that sometimes a guy can be running with the ones and at the end of training camp, he can get let go. And there's a ripple effect in the locker room because everybody's like, well, shoot, man, they let him go. He was running with the ones. I'm running with the ones. Is my job in jeopardy? You know, how secure is my situation? So there's a lot of that going on. And then I think that for young players, listen, let's, let's talk about, let's talk, dive into the dichotomy of vet mindset. Rookie mindset. Veterans, they've been there before. Their energy is different. Their confidence is different. 
their interactions with their teammates is different. Their response to competition is different. Their understanding of how to pace themselves, how to learn the playbook, how to have a community knowledge of the play playbook, even though they may not be doing all the reps, is different. Rookies are on the opposite side. They're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure out, how do I act like a vet when I'm a rookie? Because you've got to act like a vet. you got to act like you belong. You know, my wife talks all the time about when you judge a queen competition, even before the competition's over, the judges know who the queen is because she's wearing the she's wearing the crown before they give her the crown. And in NFL camps, it's no different. As a young player, if you don't walk like, talk like, think like, respond like, work like, and most importantly, perform like the guy that should be there, you're probably not going to be there. And if you're the player that calling mom and dad and your agent and everybody else every night going, man, I just sure hope, I sure hope they like me. Hogan doesn't get you anywhere in the NFL. You have to have, have, to have confident energy when you're in the NFL training camp. You have to show up every day, and every time you have a bad play, every time you have a missed opportunity, every time you have a self-sabotage, every time you miss, you don't get in. It could be a period where you don't even get in. Maybe they're uh, tagging you for being a special teamer your first year, and they really don't have plans for you. They don't have need for you to play at your position, your main primary position. It could be a linebacker. It could be a safety. It could be anything like that. But you don't know that. And you get really worried. The player gets really upset, gets very nervous because he's not getting reps at his position. When, in fact, the team doesn't even care. The team just wants them to, to learn that position and be later on in the season, if there's an injury, they just want him to be a dynamite special teams guy. Well, the problem with that is most people don't grow up dreaming of being the Matthew Slater of the NFL. You know, the guy with the Patriots that played for 14, 15 years and went to the Pro Bowl more than 10 times and made a lot of money primarily being a special teams demon for the Patriots. That's not a mindset that most rookies have. When guys get ready for the draft and they're training in, in a variety of places and leading up to the combine, that whole pre-draft evaluation process, they're not thinking, about, I, want to be a, I want to be a special teams demon. No, they want to play their position, tight end or receiver, or running back, whatever it is. But in the NFL, you have to find a role. You have to fit a role. And teams have roles that are different than what players are customarily uh, used to in college. Every team needs a couple guys on, on punt coverage that are a certain thing. They, they're going to make the tackle. They're going to defeat the block. They're going to protect, they're going to protect the block, the, the punter, but then they're going to make the play on the returner. And that's an incredibly valuable and important role for an NFL team and an NFL game that players don't necessarily realize that that's the equivalent of being a starter on defense, being a starter tight end, whatever it may be. Here's an issue that pops up in NFL training camps that is very, very uh, confusing, very difficult, and can cost a guy a lot of money, and that is... How do you handle injuries? So what happens is if you have a season-ending injury, it's a no-brainer. Uh, you're probably going to have surgery. They're going to put you on injury, injury reserve, and you're going to be out for the year. I'm talking about the gray area injuries where if you – sometimes you get the feeling that they want you to play hurt, and player by rule has to disclose that he's hurt. Uh, some of these guys go outside the training room to get treatment because they don't want the team to think they're a hypochondriac. But it's that dichotomy of do you play or do you not? I remember talking to um, the Cowboys a number of years ago. Uh, Miriam Barber was a rookie. Uh, may he rest in peace. I can't believe he's gone. But Miriam Barber was a star running back for the Cowboys in the early 2000s. And his rookie year as a fourth rounder, I wasn't sure he was going to make it. And so I called the front office and I said, hey, if he doesn't play, Parcells is not going to keep him. And so I called Mary and I am B3 and I said, dude, you got to play. It was the last preseason game. It was in Seattle. It was when they had four preseason games. And he didn't even get in until the third quarter, but they ran him like seven, eight times in a row. And, then what, and he had a, a messed up toe going into the game. So I was not sure if he should play. And I said, hey, man, if you want to make the team, you got to play. So he goes up to Seattle. 
uh, does does very well, makes a team, but doesn't. He, he has surgery the next week because that toe was a real issue, and he didn't contribute to the Cowboys until October of his rookie year because of that injury. But it's like if he wouldn't have, you know, nobody knows. I certainly don't. But if he wouldn't have played against Seattle and that fourth preseason the game, there's no telling that he might not have made the 53. And he might not have had the career that he had. And he might not have ever played for the Cowboys because somebody else may have picked him up. He might have, he might have been a practice squad lifer, for all we know. So I think that one of the things that's very challenging for players is when they do get dinged to make the decision, do I play or do I not? And there's a lot of factors. You know, certainly the number one factor is, are you, you know, is it going to, is it going to cripple you? Is it going to put them in a situation where it's, if they give her, if they gave us the hyper war, uh, they're not going to be able to play football game. Well, in that case, you don't play. But if it's a situation where you play hurt, you show the team you're tough, uh, it's something you can recover from. There's about 10 days between final cuts and the first regular season game. If that's enough time to get yourself ready, then you should play, okay? Um, but that's a, that's a, that's always a decision made between the player and the agent, and every good agent's going to let the player make the decision because it's his body, but the agent's going to give him feedback and counsel on whether he should or shouldn't play, and the agent's got to know the gravity of the injury, and he's also got to know the, the perspective that the organization has about the player. What is their thoughts? What is their projections? What are their plans? And dice, decipher does, for the player, hey man, my recommendation is you do or you don't because of X or Y. So I want to stop right there on uh, episode two of 2024 um, Pro Mindset Training Camp. And I want to uh, put a shout out again for Pro Mindset, the book on craigdoman.com. And we'll catch you the next time. It's Craig Doman, the host of Pro Mindset Podcast. I want to thank you for listening or watching today's show. And you can catch us every week on the normal social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and all the listening uh, podcast platforms. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And more importantly, I hope you gained a Pro Mindset insight. Please be sure to rate and review Pro Mindset Podcast. And I look forward to catching up with you on our next show.